Thank you all so much, and good morning. Um, one of the things that the Dalai Lama frequently asks us when we meet with him is, what is your motivation for doing this work? Uh, what is your intention? And I'd like to begin this morning with a little contemplative reflection or contemplative practice. Uh, and uh, if you all um, just please uh, sit up straight. And you can keep your eyes open or closed. And simply reflect on what it is that brings us all to this work. I think we all have an intuition that calming our minds and opening our hearts can be very valuable for ourselves, but even more importantly, can be valuable for our interactions with others and their interactions with others and just rippling and spreading and affecting so many different beings. And as we begin our work today, the second day of this really amazing meeting, let's just steep ourselves in this reflection of how the practices that we're considering can be so helpful to not just our own well-being, but to the well-being of children, of families, and of all others who may be touched by our interactions. So let's simply spend a few moments in reflection as we consider and enter into the work that we're here to do today and the work that this meeting will catalyze. Thank you. And as we uh, begin this morning, uh, this is a picture of His Holiness when he visited our lab for the first time in 2001. And he has been uh, the chief catalyst and uh, uh, inspirer uh, and instigator in many ways uh, in helping to nurture uh, this hybrid discipline that many of us are calling contemplative science or contemplative neuroscience. And uh, a, a week from today, actually, I'm about to leave to go to India to spend a week with him at his residence uh, for one of these very unusual meetings uh, that are held in his residence. And this one will be on the theme of craving, desire, and addiction. Uh, his Holiness has told us that for the rest of his time on the planet, he has two major commitments. One is to work on behalf of the Tibetan people, and the other is to interact with scientists. May other religious and political leaders have similar <laughs> intentions. I'd like to begin this morning with uh, a, a brief discussion that situates the science and where we are. For those of you who came to um, the dialogue that we had with John Kabat-Zinn on Friday night, I apologize. Uh, um, I uh, sort of spontaneously said this at the dialogue, and I thought, gee, this is a good way to begin today. So 
Um, but it, it, it won't hurt to repeat it for those of you who are there. I know that there are a number of you who, who were there. Uh, but there is something unusual that um, brings a number of strands of science together that is enabling this work to go forward in a way that just wasn't possible even five years ago. And I'd like to just name those four uh, themes that are enabling this work today. The first is neuroplasticity. And this is simply the body of research that teaches us that the brain is the organ of experience. It's the organ that changes in response to experience, in response to training. And we now understand many different mechanisms of neuroplasticity that we did not understand before. One of them, which is really cool, uh, and uh, something that we were taught just the opposite when we went to graduate school several decades ago, and that is that the brain actually grows new neurons. We were once taught that that just wasn't possible. We were once taught that the brain was different than other organs in the body. When you injure your skin, we all know that it heals, and it heals because new cells are formed. We were taught that the brain is different. Once cells are injured, that's it. We now know that that's just plain wrong. An average human adult brain grows somewhere between five and 10,000 new neurons each day. Those neurons are incorporated into circuits that play an important role in our highest mental functions. We also know that stress has a deleterious effect on neurogenesis, on the growth of new brain cells. We do not know whether mental practices of the form that we're considering in this meeting stimulates neurogenesis, but it's certainly a reasonable hypothesis. But the fact of neuroplasticity enables us to put the work on contemplative practice on a more solid scientific footing and understand that this is clearly one of the mechanisms that enables the kind of change to occur that is um, described uh, in the, both the traditional texts as well as the modern scientific research. The second theme is epigenetics. And epigenetics uh, simply refers to the idea that our genes are not quite as fixed as we once thought they were. Uh, we all are born with a fixed complement of DNA these base pairs don't change their sequence unless we're exposed to radiation, which causes mutations or some other very unusual process. But for the most part, they don't change. But what does very dynamically change is the extent to which particular genes are turned on or turned off. We can think of genes having a little volume control. And that volume control which regulates the extent to which genes are expressed, is highly dynamic and highly influenced by our behavior, by our environment, and likely by our demeanor and by our comportment. And this also provides another mechanism for understanding how transformation occurs. The third idea or theme is that there are massive bi-directional pathways between the brain and the body. And so circuits in the brain that are important for regulating attention and regulating emotion talk to peripheral biology. They talk to the body. And they influence the body. And correspondingly, the body will continuously influence the brain and bathe the brain in feedback. And this is a bi-directional highway that is um, highly dynamic and plays a very important role in our well-being. Uh, this is why uh, working directly on the body can have influence on the mind. And it's also why uh, happiness and unhappiness 
are associated with different health outcomes. They're associated with different health outcomes because the circuits in the brain that are associated with our emotions very much influence the body in ways that impact health. The fourth theme is really very new uh, in terms of hard-nosed research, but this is a theme where I will claim that there is now very, very good scientific evidence to suggest that we are born with an innate bias for goodness. Six-month-old infants have a preference for looking at attending to altruistic encounters compared to, un, um, compared to encounters that are competitive and uh, antagonistic. It's not just humans, but recent evidence suggests that some non-human primates have this innate bias as well. Um, it's not to say that aggression can't be found early on, but if you give an organism a choice, it will choose altruism over competition. It will choose cooperation over hindrance. And this has been clearly now shown in very, very young infants. And so part of what we talk about in contemplative practice is not so much that we're creating kindness or creating compassion, but what we're actually doing is recognizing, familiarizing ourselves with these qualities that are likely there from the start and nurturing them. And I often talk about qualities like kindness and compassion in the same way that we talk about language. We are all born with an innate capacity for language. But we need a linguistic community for that competence to emerge. And similarly, for qualities like kindness and compassion, we need a community to nurture those qualities so that they emerge. But they are there from the start. They need reinforcement. They need support. They need nourishment for them to be expressed. So this is what's happening. All of these four themes are themes that are not part of the, quote, meditation literature. This is all in now mainstream scientific research. And it is providing a context for us to understand how contemplative practices may actually be affecting the mind, brain, and body. Now, I want to move on to um, work that's directly relevant to this meeting. This comes from a speech that Arne Duncan, the, secret the current secret US Secretary of Education, gave <laughs> Uh, to a meeting uh, of Head Start in May of 2013, this past spring. And I'd like to read this to you. Arne Duncan said, we know from research that the development of skills like grit, resilience, and self-regulation early in life are essential to success later in life. This work is hugely important to me. Schools and districts must do much more to help us understand whether we are developing the non-cognitive skills that predict student success in college, careers, and life. Now, we can quibble with the label non-cognitive. I personally don't think it's a great label. But um, nevertheless, that's what it's sort of been called in the literature. And so uh, for better or for worse, that's a label that we're, we're stuck with to a large extent. But I think that we know what what, what is meant by this. So what is the evidence that practices of the sort that we're considering in this meeting, contemplative practices, can actually make a difference with non-cognitive skills? Well, this is a paper that was published in 2005. I'm not going to go over the details. The title says it all. Self-discipline outdoes IQ in predicting academic performance of adolescents. And I can show you 50 more slides with titles that are similar. 
the evidence is quite clear. These so-called non-cognitive skills trump standard measures of intelligence in predicting even academic performance and life success. And so this provides a, an amazingly propitious opportunity for us in applying the kinds of practices that we're considering to make a difference for this domain of so-called non-cognitive skills. This is one of my all-time favorite quotes in, in psychology. This comes from William James's Principles of Psychology that was published in 1890. Um, and it, he has a chapter on attention in this two-volume tome. And he said, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. No one is compo sui if he have it not. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. But it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. And by the way, the italics were in the original William James. I think if William James had contact with the contemplative traditions, he would have instantaneously seen that these are vehicles for educating attention, among other things, but certainly for educating attention. And this is one of the foundational so-called non-cognitive skills. And yet, traditional education spends virtually no time in actually educating attention. Now, what is the evidence that attention can be educated? So let me first show you, um, this is uh, data from kids with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And I've circled a histogram of response time distributions. Uh, the technical stuff is not important, but what is important is that one of the, is what this reflects. Children with ADHD are very variable in their attention. Uh, it's not that their attention is slow all the time, they just are very variable, and that variability is expressed in this um, very uh, broad response time distribution. It um, extends out uh, with this long tail. Now, if you look at age-matched children who are typically developing, uh, what you see is a much narrower distribution. So <clears throat> this is a, a, an objective, hard-nosed metric of variability in attention. So we can ask the question, does a simple practice of mindfulness meditation make a difference on this very metric that has been found to be uh, central to characterizing the difficulties of children with attention problems. So um, we did a study that we published a couple of years ago, a number of years ago, uh, that addressed this issue, uh, where we asked whether three months of intensive practice of mindfulness meditation can make a difference. Uh, in this exact metric. And so let me just show you the data. Um, if you look on the right that's circled there, this is a measure of variability, the same metric that I showed you plotted in the histogram in the previous slide. Lower numbers on this metric indicate better performance because it means less variability. And what I'm showing you here are practitioners. These are individuals who are practicing for three months intensively. Time one is before they begin to practice, and time two is after the three months of practice. <coughs> and then we have novices who are just learning to practice and practice for one week prior to uh, the second time interval. And what we see is that among the novices, there's no change in their response time distributions from time one to time two. Among the practitioners who are practicing 
a mindfulness practice intensively for three months, there is a dramatic drop in response time variability. Uh, this denotes uh, a less variable response time, more consistent attention. Um, and uh, we also measured brain activity uh, when they were performing this selective attention task. And I won't go through all the details because it would take too long. But suffice it to say that there are corresponding changes on certain metrics of brain activity that were associated with the changes in this metric of response time variability that we observed. And by the way, this is work um, done by Antoine Lutz when he was in our lab. He was the first author, and this work was published in 2009. So uh, what about other so-called non-cognitive factors uh, like kindness and compassion? And I'd like to uh, share with you findings from uh, a very recent study that was published uh, in 2013. Uh, it was alluded to by um, at least one speaker yesterday. Uh, uh, and this is work that was done by Helen Wang. Uh, and it asked the question whether short-term compassion training can affect the brain. Uh, in this work, we, th this was work where we, the participants were actually um, college students here at the University of Wisconsin. <clears throat> and we recruited participants to sign up for a study in which they were told that they would be offered one of two different interventions, both of which are designed to cultivate well being. That's what they were told. And we randomly assigned the participants to either a group that received compassion meditation training, and I'll tell you the, I'll describe the nature of that in a minute. Uh, another group was randomly assigned to a, an intervention that was structurally matched to the compassion intervention, but received cognitive uh, training that came straight from cognitive therapy, where participants were taught to reappraise events to make them uh, uh, less focused on um, consistent views of, uh, ne of uh, negative uh, aspects of their self uh, and to uh, learn to attribute them to uh, other causes. And uh, so that's the way the, the experiment went. Uh, and I'll describe it in more detail in a moment. Uh, so we had two weeks of, of training, and the two weeks consisted of 30 minutes a day. And one of the things that was unusual about this study is that all of the training, both for the compassion group as well as for the cognitive training group, were con was conducted over the internet. So they had daily practice over the internet for 30 minutes a day for two weeks. They logged on to a protected website to receive this training. And by the way, if anyone is interested, you can go to our center website, uh, and I'll show you that at the end. It's uh, investigatinghealthyminds.org. And we have the compassion training online available to anyone for free. Uh, you can log on and get the same training as these participants and, and try it for yourself. Um, with the comparison group, as I mentioned, was taught this cognitive reappraisal. So for those of you who are not familiar um, with this kind of practice, let me just very briefly go through what the participants in the compassion training group received. Uh, they were asked to contemplate and visualize the suffering and then relief from suffering from a, with, for a number of different categories of people. We had them start with a loved one, where they were asked to visualize this loved one. It could be a family member or a very close friend Bring them into your heart and your mind. And visualize a time in their life when they may have been suffering. And cultivate the strong aspiration that they be relieved of that suffering. We then had them move on to themselves. Visualize a time in your own life when you may have been suffering. And cultivate the aspiration that you be relieved of that suffering. We then had them move on to a stranger. And we defined a stranger for them as someone whose face you recognize. It could be a neighbor 
who you clearly recognize, but you don't know much about their life. It could be a person who is in the same class as you. It could be someone who works in a building that you work in. It could be a bus driver. Uh, it could be a cashier at a store that you frequent. Someone who you see on a regular basis and clearly recognize and really don't know much about them. And just imagine a time in their life when they may have been suffering and cultivate the strong aspiration that they be relieved of that suffering. We then have them move on to a difficult person, someone who really pushes your buttons, or maybe not extremely pushes your buttons, but um, we, we actually do have people calibrate and not use someone that's too extreme, um, but uh, someone who does push your buttons. Uh, and um, Mingyur Rinpoche, a well-known Tibetan meditation teacher, has said in some writing that um, uh, something like uh, uh, two hours of practice on a difficult person is equivalent to two months of practice uh, on all the other categories. <laughs> so this, this, there's a lot of important um, transformation that is possible. Um, at least according to the traditions with this. And finally, we have them move on to all beings or as many beings as someone can um, embrace in their mind. Uh, we have them use a phrase uh, uh, such as, may you be free from suffering, may you experience joy and ease, that they repeat silently to themselves as they're doing this. And the participants are instructed to notice visceral sensations that may arise as they engage in this practice, particularly sensations around the heart. And finally, they are instructed to feel the compassion emotionally and not to simply repeat these phrases cognitively. Now, this was a very elaborate experiment where, uh, as I mentioned, participants were truly randomly assigned to one of these two groups. Um, uh, at the beginning, and then they uh, actually get an MRI scan before they start. Uh, then they go through the two weeks of training, uh, and then we have a second MRI scan that we do after the two weeks of training. And we also administer some um, strange economic decision-making tasks uh, at the very end. Uh, and these strange economic decision-making tasks are one way to capture the extent to which people actually behave altruistically um, uh, in a setting where there are real financial consequences that are on the line. Uh, and again, I don't have time to go into the nature of these tasks in detail, but um, uh, they are tasks that are being used extensively in the behavioral and neuroeconomics literature and um, uh, Danny Kahneman, who is a psychologist uh, who has contributed enormously to the literature on behavioral economics, and he won the Nobel Prize in economics a number of years ago, uh, and many, many years ago, way before he won the Nobel Prize, he's a good friend of mine, and Danny said to me, Richie, if you really want to change the world, you better start hanging around more with economists. Um, so. Uh, uh, I have dutifully taken that on, and um, we're using uh, a number of these tasks in, in much of our ongoing work now. Uh, and one of the things that we found on this task is that after two weeks of compassion training compared to two weeks of cognitive reappraisal training, participants behave more altruistically, uh, the participants who are randomly assigned to the compassion group. So after just two weeks of training for 30 minutes a day, that's a total of about seven hours of training. Uh, on these hard-nosed economic decision-making tasks, they actually behave more altruistically. Now, we don't know how long it's going to last, and I'm frequently asked that question, and I frequently say in response to that question, if they continue to practice, um, there's some reason to believe that it may last. But if they stop practicing, probably it won't last. Uh, and so one of the goals of this work is to provide um, individuals with simple tools that they can use every day uh, uh, and uh, strengthen these habits of mind. 
Now, we also saw changes in the brain that occur after just two weeks. And again, I'm not going to dwell on the details of this, but the cool thing was that the extent to which the brain changed actually predicted the extent to which people behaved altruistically on the economic decision-making tasks. <clears throat> and we saw changes in the prefrontal cortex, which is here, and an area of parietal cortex that has been implicated in perspective taking and in studies of empathy. So um, I want to uh, just briefly mention that um, the, uh, the changes that we see, um, uh, so far I've, I've talked about changes just in the brain. Um, I'm just getting out my glasses so I can see what time it is. Oh, he's holding them. Good. <laughs> Mindlessness. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, so uh, I want to just say a little bit about uh, the, the notion that the changes in the circuits that we see in the brain uh, also affect uh, circuits in the body. As I mentioned early on, there's bidirectional communication between uh, the brain and the body. And when we change these circuits in the brain, we're not just changing the brain. We also seem to be affecting the body. And one of the um, uh, intuitions that uh, I've been really excited about the possibility of pursuing in this whole area of contemplative science, which and this is something where we really don't have good data today, but it's the intuition that people who practice um, these kinds of practices may actually um, become healthier, not just mentally in terms of their mental well-being, but also in terms of their physical well-being. And they may actually decrease their utilization of healthcare services. They may show a decrease in prescription drug costs. And if that actually turns out to be true, every corporation in America is going to want to be part of this. Um, uh, and uh, I was shown data uh, uh, a couple of years ago about the cost to the Madison Metropolitan School District for a single class of prescription drug benefits, and that was for antidepressant medication. Um, the cost to the Madison Metropolitan School District for that single category was astronomical. Uh, and I think we could do better. Uh, I think that we can actually reduce those costs with these kinds of practices that are offered to both teachers as well as their students. Now, that's purely speculation at this point. We need the data, but this is the kind of data that I think will, will help produce a tipping point in this culture. So what evidence do we have? The evidence that we have now is really very basic, and it's from studies with very small sample sizes that have inherent limitations that are done in the laboratory, but nevertheless, they're telling. One study was a study that we did a number of years ago with a corporation here in Madison, Wisconsin, Promega Corporation. It's a corporation, a high-tech corporation. Uh, and we offered a um, eight-week mindfulness meditation program to employees. We randomly assigned them to a mindfulness meditation group or to a weightless control group, which um, uh, we would say today is not adequate um, in terms of uh, really being rigorous, because we can't say with certainty that the effects are due to the mindfulness pra practice itself. But nevertheless, those were early days. And what we found in that study is that after eight weeks of meditation, compared to the control group, participants showed greater, higher antibody titer levels to a flu vaccine, um, which simply means that the flu vaccine was working more effectively. Uh, and this was a way to um, get a quantitative index of the potential impact of meditation practice on this aspect of peripheral biology. <clears throat> More recently, we've been looking at mechanisms of inflammation. We've also done studies looking at epigenetic changes um, with meditation, which I'm not going to talk about because they're very, very new data, and we want to 
Uh, we want these data to be published before I um, say much about them. But I will tell you about one study which was just published uh, done by Melissa Rosencrantz in our lab uh, where we induced an inflammatory response experimentally in participants. And what you see here, these tiny little circles are extremely small blisters that we actually create ourselves. It sounds pretty gruesome. Uh, we've had it, all of us have had it done to ourselves. It really is not painful at all. We use a vacuum system to uh, lift the first layer of skin and it occurs over, it's done very slowly over about a 45 minute period. And um, so we create these blisters and then we smear around the blisters this white cream um, and the white cream has as its active ingredient capsaicin, um, which is, comes from chili peppers. And what it induces is a local inflammatory response in the skin. And that produces a flare that we can actually measure. Um, and we can measure the flare size and actually quantify the rate at which healing occurs. And through the blisters, what we do is we extract the blister fluid and we can actually look at um, uh, molecular markers that are associated with inflammation and with healing. Uh, and I won't go through all the details. These data are now published. Um, but um, what we do see is a change in, um, in, flare, in the flare size. What, what happens when you do this procedure is that in, in normal participants, uh, if you induce a flare uh, and then two months later you do it again, you actually sensitize the person and the flare actually gets larger and heals more slowly. Um, and what we find here is, um, so these are the data from, from the, just looking at flare size. And HEP uh, is a very rigorous comparison group that we have used. It's called the Health Enhancement Program and it's rigorously matched to mindfulness-based stress reduction. And what we see is that among the participants who get the HEP, the flare actually increases in size over time, whereas in the mindfulness-based stress reduction group, it doesn't change. And at time two, there's a significant difference between these groups. Uh, and it, it, it suggests that there are uh, effects on inflammatory responses. Uh, that may be produced by mindfulness-based stress reduction in decreasing the inflammatory response. And the data on the molecular mediators uh, show the same thing as well. Uh, so these findings simply underscore the fact that it's not just changes in the mind and the brain that are produced, but also changes in the body. Now, uh, this is a um, a paper from a, Duke, a group at Duke University that was published in 2011, a really important paper in my view. Uh, and it involved this a study, a very unusual study that they've been um, at for many, many years. They've been following a group of 1,000 um, people, a birth cohort that was born in Dunedin, New Zealand. Dunedin is a city very much like Madison. It's a university town. Uh, it's a little smaller than Madison. Uh, and uh, they've been following a, a thousand people from birth uh, in this city of New Zealand. Uh, and they have been looking at the relation between measures that they acquire early in life in these individuals and later adult outcomes. And this particular paper looked at the relation between metrics of a child's capacity to exert self-control. And I'll say more about what that means in a moment. But a child's capacity at age four and five to exert self-control and the, uh, a number of very important life outcomes when they were 32 years of age. And the life outcomes at 32 years of age included the um, extent to which they used um, illegal substances, substance abuse, uh, the, um, the uh, financial success of these individuals, including their actual income, after very carefully controlling for the socioeconomic status of their families of origin. These are very sophisticated investigators and they, they exerted a lot of all the proper controls that you would want in a study like this. And so let me just show you a little bit of the data. On the left here, um, well, first of all, on, on, uh, on the x-axis uh, is plotted the um, 
the extent of childhood self-control. So the, high, the highest quintile are the kids who have the best self-control, the lowest quintile the kids who have the worst self-control. And on the left here are plotted uh, uh, substance abuse indices and indices of poor health. And what these data show is that kids who have the worst self-control at age four and five, when they're 32 years of age, they actually have the highest levels of informant-rated substance dependence, which is the blue line. And all the others go along the same axis. Uh, on the right, we have measures of financial success, including actual income. And what they found is that the kids who are in the highest level of the highest quintile of self-control when they were four and five earned approximately $6,500 a year more in US dollars compared to their counterparts who are in the lowest quintile of self-control when they are four and five years of age. Uh, also, what's displayed here are financial struggles, measures of financial planfulness, and all of this goes in the direction that you would expect. And finally, the last measure that I'll show you, whoops, is adult criminal convictions. These are documented criminal convictions. And what you see is that the, the kids who are in the lowest quintile of self-control when they're four and five have just much, much higher levels of adult criminal convictions compared to the um, kids who had the highest levels of self-control when they were four and five. And let me just read you one line from the abstract of this paper. Um, what they said is that interventions addressing self-control might reduce a panoply of societal costs, save taxpayers money, and promote prosperity. Really important. Now, Jim Heckman, who was mentioned, I think, yesterday, uh, who is a Nobel laureate in economics, in Chicago said that, um, it, from his analyses, that there's a return of $7 for every $1 of public investment in quality preschool programs based upon hard-nosed economic analyses. So based on all this, um, we in our Center for Investigating Healthy Minds, and when I say we, I mean Laura Pinger and Lisa Fluke, um, have been working on the development of uh, this preschool kindness curriculum uh, and uh, implementing it now in the Madison public school system. Uh, this is a curriculum that has pulled together uh, um, activities and um, practices from many, um, many other programs that are out there. And uh, this is just a description of uh, one version of this curriculum. It's gone through a number of iterations uh, just week by week. And I should also say that there are many others in the room who've played an important role in this work. Uh, and this just, uh, th these are just titles of what goes on in the um, lessons for each week. Uh, uh, and this is a curriculum that we have been working with extensively. Um, uh, we first piloted it in the preschool at the Wasteman Center here on campus. And uh, last year and this year, uh, we're working with the 4K uh, program in the Madison Metropolitan School District. And um, uh, last year, we uh, tested approximately 87 children who were uh, randomly assigned by classroom to either the kindness curriculum or to uh, uh, a standard curriculum. And I'll just um, show you a little bit of data. Um, this is very recent analyses that Lisa has done. Um, and one task that we gave is a delay of gratification task. And um, this is a task uh, that has been a very famous one in assessing, quote, non-cognitive factors. And this just indicates the, the items. Uh, and so, uh, uh, the choice that a child has is between one snack now and three snacks later, or between one crayon now and five crayons later, and so forth. And there are different, um, uh, there are different rewards uh, and different amounts on each trial. The tokens can be exchanged later for um, uh, rewards and prizes that the kids can get. 
And um, what we found is that if you just look at the total delay of gratification, uh, this is uh, the KC is the kindness curriculum, this is the control, this is before the intervention and after the intervention. And there's a slight um, uh, difference, uh, uh, pre to post difference in the kindness curriculum compared, and, and no significant difference in the controls. But if you look at some of the um, items more specifically, uh, particularly where the uh, delay of gratification is five, that is one versus five, uh, one now or five later, you see a bigger difference in the kindness curriculum, a uh, significant difference pre to post. As you can see, there's no difference between the kindness curriculum and the controls pre, but they do show a gain at post. Um, we have a task <coughs> that um, we use that we've called the uh, self-other sharing task, and uh, uh, we give the kids a bunch of stickers and ask uh, them to divide it between an envelope where the stickers go to themselves or an envelope where they go to others, and it could be their best friend, their least favorite person, a stranger child, or an obviously sick-looking child, which is what you see here. And, um, uh, uh, and these are all the categories that we have represented here. And what we see is that, um, and this is a, a pattern which we honestly were not predicting. Uh, it's a little complicated, but what we see is in the kindness curriculum, when we look pre to post, there is no change. But among the controls who are getting a standard curriculum, they actually get more selfish over time. Uh, 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 and so the controls are showing uh, this is uh, giving to their least favorite person. They start off giving the same number of stickers as the kindness group before the intervention. But after uh, uh, 12 weeks in this case, uh, they're actually more, more selfish. They're giving less uh, to the least favorite person, to the sick child. We see the same thing. Um, before, uh, they're the same as the kids in the kindness curriculum, as we would expect since they're randomly assigned. But after 12 weeks, they, they, sh they show a pattern that's more selfish. Um, they are giving less to the sick child, but among the kids in the kindness curriculum, they're maintaining their higher levels of generosity. Um, school grades are assigned by the teachers, uh, even in, in preschool, uh, on these dimensions. Uh, learning, cognition, health, language, and social emotional growth. And you can see that on a number of these, comparing the weightless control group to the kindness curriculum, um, there are uh, significant differences on a number of these uh, formal categories on which the teachers actually grade the children. And all of those differences, significant differences, are in the direction of the kids who are receiving the kindness curriculum showing significant gains. Um, so uh, these findings suggest that, in fact, uh, a, a simple eight or 12-week curriculum that is administered uh, to preschool children can make a difference on some objective behavioral measures. Uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. This work here in Madison is being done uh, with sample sizes of um, by the end, we're, we're right in the middle of this now. This is an interim analysis. We're collecting um, uh, a little over 100, 100 kids this year. And I should also say, one thing I neglected to say, is that teachers are given uh, an, an eight-week uh, training in mindfulness practice before the kids are introduced to the kindness curriculum uh, as part of what we do. Um, but we're doing this in, in 200 participants. It needs to be done not in 2,000, but in 20,000 uh, in cities all across America. Uh, and we need resources to do that. And I can tell you that the federal government is not about to give us those resources. Um, and so uh, before the feds will pay attention to this, um, we need uh, the evidence base to establish the um, uh, the importance of this. So I want to very briefly mention in the last couple of minutes that I have another project in which we're engaged. I'm not going to show you any data, but I'll just tell you about the project. This is a project that's funded by the uh, 
Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and it's a project where we're developing video games. These are actually apps that will work on tablets um, to cultivate uh, a separate app to cultivate mindfulness and one to cultivate um, pro-social behavior, kindness and empathy. Um, so uh, uh, we've developed a behavioral measure of mindfulness that's based on breath counting. I don't have time to go into it in detail. But um, it's simply, if you ask a person to press, um, to tap on an iPad with every breath cycle, it turns out that if you ask them to do that, people, um, people, adults and children, can do that extremely accurately. If we measure objectively respiration, the correlation between their taps and an objective measure of respiration is virtually perfect. However, we also have them do something else. We have them tap with two fingers every nth breath, every fifth breath, for example. Uh, and if you have them tap with one finger every breath, and then two fingers every fifth breath, turns out they make mistakes. And their mistakes are highly correlated with reports of mind wandering. And in many ways, this can be thought of as a simple behavioral measure of mindfulness. And it can also be captured in a game mechanic where we can actually train kids to be mindful of their breathing using this simple game mechanic. So that's um, what we did. And this is just uh, some basic research that uh, Daniel Levinson and I did. And it's simply showing the percentage of errors in this kind of breath counting task and um, mind wandering reports that we get with experience sampling. Uh, and it shows that uh, um, uh, the uh, fewer errors that you make, the more on task you are on um, these experience sampling measures. The more errors that you make, um, the more your mind is wandering based on these experience sampling measures. And so uh, this is a game called Tenacity. It will uh, hopefully within a year be available to the public. Um, it is not yet released. We're still actively doing research. We're actually doing a huge study now, randomly assigning children to play these games and actually measuring brain function and structure before they play the games. And then after several weeks of game playing, we also get all kinds of other behavioral measures. And what happens is that these are different scenes. Uh, this is, uh, and correct breath counting is rewarded by these scenes becoming populated with beautiful landscapes the growth of flowers and so forth. And so um, this is the way we reward, um, uh, quote, achievement on this game. And when kids play this, they report actually being quite calm uh, and um, uh, feeling uh, uh, in, in much greater emotional balance. Uh, we've done extensive play testing with kids uh, in this age range, literally hundreds of children. We also have play tested this with some experts <laughs> uh, who uh, have given us a lot of advice. And in fact, we actually put in the um, application to the Gates Foundation a line item to bring in contemplatives to play the game to provide us with feedback um, from a first person perspective and argue that this was something really important for maintaining the integrity and authenticity of these games. Um, on the right is uh, my wonderful collaborator here at Wisconsin in the Games Learning and Society group, Constance Steinkuhler, who is one of the um, top scientists in the world who is doing research on games for impact. And she's based here at WID. Um, the second game we call Crystals of Kador. And Crystals of Kador uh, basically is a Fantasy game, you, the scenario is you've just landed on this alien planet, uh, and the aliens do not speak your language, but they have the same emotions that you have. Uh, and uh, the way you navigate and the way you earn points in this game is by figuring out what they're feeling and by engaging in cooperative interactions with them that um, involve helping them. And that is what is rewarded in this game. Uh, and so we have these aliens with highly realistic facial expressions that are um, uh, modulated in um, extremely anatomically realistic ways. 
uh, and we have ways of actually calibrating a player's um, uh, um, perception of these facial expressions, and they have to use the detection of these expressions to make inferences about what the players are feeling, what the aliens are feeling, and they have to respond in pro-social ways in order to advance in the game. So um, we believe that these out-of-the-box approaches are going to be important and um, something we uh, uh, have to consider within our toolbox um, uh, as we go forward. So uh, the other thing that we're doing in this study is we're using some extremely sensitive novel measures of the development of new connections in the brain. This is just an image that comes from uh, our lab using diffusion tensor imaging, which is a way to image these white matter connections in the brain. And there's new data that's been published very, very recently by a group in Israel uh, with kids playing action games that show that one and a half hours of game playing is sufficient to induce a measurable structural change in the brain. One and a half hours. So folks, our brains are constantly being shaped, constantly being influenced, wittingly or unwittingly. Most of it is unwitting. And the whole invitation of this meeting and the work that it represents is that we can actually be more thoughtful, more intentional, uh, and more um, uh, virtuous, if you will, in how we wittingly influence our own brains to support um, uh, pro-social and uh, healthy habits of mind. So for those of you who want to learn more, you can go to our center website, investigatinghealthyminds.org. And um, let me just end with really the most important slide, which is um, uh, just acknowledging the amazing work of an extraordinary team. This is really just a, a small subset of the team, uh, the senior members of the team that I am blessed to have the privilege and opportunity to work with on a daily basis. And uh, for that, I am extremely grateful. So thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions.